Each presenter has just five minutes to speak and two minutes for questions. And I will be uh, shepherding you along. So I apologize in advance for inter interrupting you, but do uh, feel free to carry on the discussion within the chat or within the, the Google Doc. This, the format of this call um, has been long established and it's just because we want to get as many projects in front of people as possible, but we always are welcome or open to your feedback. You can add that to the document as well. This call, um, as other Force 11 events, is governed by our code of conduct. So that's to say that uh, we want you to think about uh, an international audience when you're speaking, to please speak slowly, make sure that everyone can hear you, um, to engage respectfully with others on the call and your, your comments, questions, um, to be aware of mindful, or sorry, of uh, jargon, slang, and, and that type of thing. If there are any issues um, with how you feel you're being treated or anyone else is being treated on the call, then feel free to contact me directly. That's my short email address, jen at libro.pub. So I'm going to move into the agenda now. Uh, there's a roll call at the top of the document, so feel free and introduce yourself there uh, so everyone knows who's, who's here and can engage you, contact you with your preferred mechanisms. Um, our speaker order, uh, we go, sorry, what page are we on? Three. The first speaker is Adam Hyde. So Candice, if you're happy, I'm happy to relinquish my screen at this point. Great. Hey. Uh, Hi, this is Adam. Should I, I just roll on through? Yes. Okay, great. I'll, um, I'll share my screen. Um, uh, if this is okay. Um, great. You see the, uh, the browser okay? We do. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, hi, everybody. Adam here. Um, indeed, 3 a.m. in New Zealand. <laughs> so um, hi to you all from uh, the, the uh, deep of night and um, thank you for the invitation. Um, so I'm um, just very briefly going to talk about the Open Publishing Festival. Um, so it's, it's connected to another event um, that um, we were involved in putting on, uh, which was called the Open Publishing Awards. Um, which we conducted last year. And we put these together essentially because we wanted to build community um, around or uh, add to building community around the notion of open publishing, which is also um, um, broad. Your chat box is open on top of your screen. Oh, yes, you're right. Sorry. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Uh, which is um, open, um, which is um, community around open publishing, which also includes scholarly communications, right? So, um, the notion wasn't to restrict it just to scholarly communications, although that's the area that COCO predominantly works, but broader than that. And there's a few reasons for that. One is that I think scholarly communications, um, in, in a way, sort of um, sits in slight isolation to the rest of what's happening in open publishing. And, um, and I think that there's very um, interesting things to be learned um, from the greater open publishing uh, context that would be very useful for scholarly communications and the other way around. I think uh, generally scholarly communications thinks about open almost purely and entirely in terms of um, open source and um, open access. And of course, you know, associated concepts, um, open data, but doesn't, um, doesn't necessarily see itself as part of something which is larger than itself um, in terms of publishing. And I think it's kind of healthy uh, to see yourself situated within another um, context. Um, so the Open Publishing Awards was established sort of that sort of baseline um, and with the notion of bringing together a lot of interesting projects and celebrating them. Um, and even though it's an award, it's not really, um, it's, we didn't talk in terms of um, people winning awards. It was more like celebrating projects um, that uh, a, pa a panel of people um, had chosen uh, as being super interesting and would be great to promote further. Um, so we took that notion forward, um, that sort of um, community driven notion to um, form the Open Publishing Fest. And the Open Publishing Fest um, uh, start, was held this year in May. 
was essentially um, uh, six weeks organizing um, or four weeks organizing and two weeks of the actual event. So we did this very fast and we did it uh, that way because it was in response to the COVID uh, pandemic crisis. And we had a sense that people within the um, community were like everybody all over the world, were in a state of anxiety, um, not feeling the best, um, perhaps uh, quite distracted. And if we could add another distraction, but a, a positive one, um, that might be a nice thing for folks. So, um, so we went ahead and did it. So we had to build the software from the ground up and also we had to build the concept from the ground up. So the concept um, is essentially a decentralized festival. Um, there was no central curatorial control. There were a few people that we invited um, to uh, put together some um, events. Um, but we threw open a um, open proposals where anybody could propose anything. And we made the proposals uh, through an online form. Um, and essentially, if anybody presented or proposed a um, event, we, um, we just green lighted it and, and almost immediately, unless we uh, thought it was uh, not on topic. Um, and so it was like, I, I wouldn't say radically decentralized, but we certainly um, took our hands off the, um, the curatorial wheel and handed it to anybody that wanted to put together an event. There's a little bit of concern going in about this um, from, um, from people who voiced to us that they thought that this would end up with sort of like diverse amount of uh, poorly constructed content. But actually we, um, we had quite the opposite. We expected about 30 events. We ended up with about 150 or so. And um, the content was, was really amazing. Um, we were really surprised at the quality, the high standard of um, each and every event. In my opinion, there wasn't a dud. Um, and also the, the content was quite diverse. It came from all over the world. We had um, a couple of communities, language communities that um, put events on for inverted commas themselves, which was really fantastic. We had the Tamil community put on a whole series of, um, of events in the fest um, around uh, free eBooks. Also the Indonesian OA community put on an, an event as well. And that was, these were in their own language, these events. Um, and um, obviously directed specifically um, at their own um, uh, communities. Um, so this was kind of, in a way, kind of an, a larger um, umbrella that held within it or provided a venue, a platform for a bunch, uh, a number of communities, a community of communities. Um, we built everything, as I said, the, um, the calendar and everything from the ground up. It's all um, open source software. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is the calendar, everything sort of faded out because as um, the time went through the calendar, events would fade out. So they're all finished now, so they're all, they all, all faded, but you can still click through things. But you can see here at the top, we had this notion of tents. We had um, a number of tents of, in which we would sort of cluster these events. Um, and this was this also worked really well. I mean, we put this event on an incredibly short time, six weeks. Um, from start to finish, and um, including building the software, and um, and yet you know we would we would spend a lot of time in little details like things like the language that we use. We decided to use fest language, you know, that people could understand should they have gone to a music event, and we, this sort of gave a um, a music fest. Um, this sort of gave a more friendly and informal um, um, approach to the to the uh, to the the proceedings. And so we spent a lot of time with things like the language and also like tents themselves, right? With these icons here, we spent like six weeks organizing the event and, and um, executing it. Yet in that time, which is extremely fast, we spent two or three days just getting the tent icons looking welcoming. So it would have this feeling like you could enter the tent. So yeah, it was, um, it was, it was really a remarkable thing. Um, I enjoyed it very much. We had a lot of um, artist performances as, as well to sort of lift the, um, everybody's feeling. We got a tremendous amount of um, positive feedback and um, we have the software and everything open source. So if you wish to do something similar that yourselves, you're willing to, you're welcome to take the, um, the, the code. And also we're welcome, uh, you're welcome to give us a call and we'd be happy to talk to anybody about um, the lessons that we learned and putting on uh, the festival itself. Yeah. All right, perfect. So that's um, seven minutes. Thanks very much, Adam. Mm -hmm. um, can I, uh, let's see if there's one question. Um, sure. Amanda, are there, is there, are there any questions for Adam? 
Currently, no questions for Adam, but if anyone wants to raise their hand or type in very quickly, might have any hands or okay. no hands and no new messages. So I will leave with a thank you, Adam, very much yeah. for your participation, especially with the time difference. So if anyone <laughs> does have follow-up questions for Adam, please add to the Zoom chat and we will make sure they get to him later. Alternatively, you can add to the meeting notes agenda. I will post that just now and we will get them to him later. Thank right, you. Thanks, Back Matt. to you, Jennifer. Yeah, thanks very much, Amanda. All right, thanks, Adam. So we're going to skip right along to Chris Hartdrink. Um, and actually, uh, about the end, okay. Uh, sorry, I'm chatting with Anita at the same time, um, just uh, with, in recognition that Anita and Asman um, did a lot of coordination of the, around the speakers from Force 2020. So, um, so Anita wants to jump in toward the end, if that's okay, and we will skip over to, to Chris. <clears throat> I couldn't unmute before, so I was a bit confused. Uh, Hello. Let me, let me just share my screen real quick. Okay. So, hey everyone, I'm Chris Harkering from Liberate Science, and we're a co-op trying to reset research work, and primarily focused on resetting research publishing first. And what I'll be talking a bit about today in a very short time span is a bit about modular research, um, specifically why it's important, how we can do it, and also the potential of it. So to start out with the why, uh, the scholarly communication system is supposed to fulfill five functions. Uh, maybe some of you have heard about these, um, but they're supposed to register results, reward results or incentivize research, provide access or discoverability of research, archive it and certify the results. And the current system technically does that, but in a, in a sort of bad faith, as we've learned throughout the past few decades because of publication bias, uh, paywalls, um, not being able to, or a reluctance to publish code and data um, by default, and also studies that pass peer review, but end up being uh, irreproducible. So we do have certification, but it ends up in irreproducible results and registration is just for a specific set. So in essence, what we see is that a lot of work goes into an article, um, but at the very end, it also misses a few key, key aspects. And that's why modular research uh, is important and where that comes in. So then the question becomes, how do you actually do that? So what our approach to that is, and that was part of my PhD research is, is actually, well, before the publication, there's free reign because the author has full control. We see that with preprints, authors can do that legally because there is no objection to that. Um, and we say, well, let's help the, communicate, uh, the author communicate even sooner uh, about specific steps that, they, uh, that they've undertaken, such that by the time that they've published the work, they've already collaborated with their peers and you know, done all the revisions and certified, et cetera, um, throughout the process instead of just at the very end. So changing from this after the fact article um, to an as you go communication, that's why modular research is important. And that's also how, how it's done because one goes, uh, one can think about, okay, what is a research step? So that's where um, we're setting up this peer-to-peer uh, -peer comments, uh, which pretty much just has this very flexible definition of what a uh, research step is. You get to assign it yourself. It can be theory, it can be predictions, it can be a specification, it can be a presentation. Pretty much anything that's in Wikidata can go in there as well. And then we, we see a totally different process come up. So what we're going to see in a second would usually be the process that's um, captured in an article, but we don't see it. So we might start out with a few revisions of an introduction section or a theory section. Um, and then leading up to the, or following from that, we might get uh, a few different sets of predictions. Uh, and then if we communicate these steps separately, we can actually link them back. And if we continue doing this, we could see, okay, we might have from those predictions, uh, several studies that we, that we design. And if we communicate those, we can link back exactly which predictions link to which studies. 
and then we can sort of go on that and we can add the data and we can start creating this full map pretty much of the research process, which then by the time that the publication is there, we do retain that. So the potential for this kind of uh, infrastructure that is based on modular research is on, not only that it gets to register all the results, um, uh, you get certified through communicating each step and which is documented so people can say, hey, uh, we think this might be, need some adjustments. So it's certifi certification by collaboration instead of just at the end by the gatekeepers. But also what we're doing is we're actually making all of that permissively um, licensed such that, you know, you see some study materials, you can just grab them and you can work with them, uh, but also for text and data mining tools. Mm. And the peer-to-peer -peer commons is just the information layer. So anybody can uh, build applications on it and at Liberate Science, we're building the first one, which is called Hypergraph. Um, we're releasing that in September, uh, but if anybody is interested to talk more or have, has questions, feel free to reach out uh, anytime. So thank you. Perfect timing. Thank you, Chris. Amanda, any questions for Chris? Yes, there is one question from Julian. Uh, hey, Chris, what is it for the researcher? Why would a researcher want to use your system? So I, I'm a researcher myself. I, I finished just a few months ago. And what at the end really bugged me was this project management. So some project, I would start it in 2015 and then in 2019, I would be, still be managing it. And it was a lot of overhead just uh, mentally also. And in that sense, what this does is also, it's not just a way to communicate, but it's also a way to manage your project because you're not managing the paper anymore, but you're managing a specific step. So in that sense, that's what it, what it brings the researcher. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is after this first release is also to really make a lot of integrations, actually also potentially with uh, Adam and Coco Foundation to really make this whole process of creating content and revising it and documenting it much easier. Thanks, Thank Chris. You. Thanks, we Amanda. So we, we probably better move on. All right, I will put other questions for you, Chris, in the meeting notes. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Um, and Chris, thanks for coming today. Um, we know you were um, hoping to, to present at FORCE 2020 in Spain, but uh, well, let's make it next year, shall we? All right, next um, we have uh, two more presenters uh, intended for Spain, uh, Tony Alves and Stephen Laverick. Hello. Hi, Tony. Can you see my screen yet or no? Not yet. Okay, let's see. How about? There, you got it. Okay. Um, do you see, do you see the presenter version or the non-presenter version? Presenter version. Uh, sorry, uh, public version. You, you look good to go. Great. So um, let me back up a little bit here. So uh, thank you. My name is Tony Alves. I'm the Director of Product Management at Aries Systems. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible so we can take questions. And I just also want to introduce Stephen Laverick, um, who is with, uh, he's the Director of Green 15 Publishing Consultancy. And uh, uh, Stephen and I are co-chairs for the uh, NISO Working Group uh, to um, make manuscript exchange common approach a, recommend, a NISO recommended practice. So uh, one of the big challenges that in scholarly publishing um, that has uh, really come about over the past several years, uh, authors and reviewers are really frustrated by the redundancy of efforts. So having to, once you're rejected, having to go to another system and do all of the same work again to get that paper submitted, uh, reviewers seeing the same paper again and again, um, as it gets uh, moves through the process. Um, and also, uh, we also have seen new uh, publication workflows come up. So things like uh, cascading workflows, uh, where papers uh, are submitted to a journal and that, that editor might decide that it might be better suited for another journal in their family or within that publisher list. 
um, and preprint servers, the rise of preprint servers, uh, people uh, uploading their file, their papers and data to a preprint server. They want to have an easy solution to move these papers from system to system. So, uh, uh, you know, and, and a, third, a third area is uh, there are a lot of tools that are being built uh, that um, are things like collab collaborative authoring tools and other sorts of tools where people are preparing their papers, uh, things like Overleaf and other, other systems. Their researchers are preparing their papers in those systems and they want to be e they want to easily uh, transmit those papers from those systems to submission systems. So uh, in the past, each submission system would uh, be implementing their own separate mechanisms with each of these different types of vendors or services. And uh, um, so uh, what we did, uh, it was really John Sack from Highwire who uh, kicked off this uh, process. Uh, the, the, major trans, uh, uh, the major submission systems, uh, Aries uh, Editorial Manager, Clarivate uh, Scholar One, eJournal Press, uh, Highwire with their Bench Press, and uh, Plus, who, was, who were building a system at the time. Uh, we all got together to talk about how we might solve this problem so that we weren't building, uh, just replicating the same uh, uh, process with multiple different vendors and try to create a, a standard way of doing it. Uh, and uh, so we actually went through a lot of work to uh, come up with a specification to define a common mechanism for transmitting paper, uh, files and metadata from system to system. Uh, and NISO took this on as a project in 2018. And on my slide here, I think you can see that um, we expanded the team so that it was truly a cross-functional um, uh, effort um, with uh, society publishers, university press, uh, um, non-publisher non -publisher organizations, and large commercial publishers. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Stephen, and Stephen, I can advance the slides if, uh, for you, for us. We've got just one more minute plus two minutes for questions. Okay, sorry about that. Go ahead, Steve. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> so, so Tony's already spoken to all the, the various different use cases, uh, journal to journal, preprint servers, various different authoring systems, um, services, uh, language editing, es essentially people that, that hold a lot of metadata about the, uh, about the article and the authors themselves. Um, and this was really around enabling, uh, enabling all of that um, to, to, to be a lot more efficient than it, than it used to be. Um, and essentially giving us something that should look like this. Uh, so you've got the various different submission systems that can talk to each other, preprint servers, um, and of course, the big blue post acceptance cloud. Uh, who knows what goes on there, but uh, hopefully we're enabling it, whatever it might be. Next one, Tony. Thank you. Uh, so um, we identified these various different areas that we needed to look at. Uh, and essentially, we came up with, with this uh, workflow uh, whereby you have the sending site, whatever that might be, um, putting together a zip file, which consists of a manuscript, the various metadata files, going over SFTP into the receiving site. Tony? Um, so we, uh, as Tony's mentioned, we managed to pull together all of these various different people from the, uh, from the publishing ecosystem, um, managing to get all of their different input around what their requirements were, what their abilities were. Uh, and we were able to come up with this framework. Um, I think that the key bit here is low barriers to entry. Um, you know, you, you'll have seen in the slides that we've got things like SFTP and XML. These are technologies that publishers are very much familiar with. Um, we, we didn't want to get into the realms of JSON and things like that, where maybe some people might not quite be able to get on board with it. Um, so that low barriers to entry was very important to us. Um, we'll look at expanding um, this a little bit later down the line. Um, and now, uh, what, two years after we kind of set everything in motion with this, um, we're, we're now a recommended NISO practice, um, or at least we will be in once a, the few last pieces of red tape have been, uh, have been sorted out. Um, so there's a few links there if you want to take a look at those, um, get in touch with us, send any questions over, um, or any questions that you might have now. Perfect, thank you. We've got about a minute and a half. Amanda, any questions coming in? We have one question, yes. Are you aware of PubFair? And it's 
sounds like many of your aims and their aims are similar. So can you talk a little bit about that? Um, so uh, the, the, it, it is something that came up uh, during the uh, discussion, uh, the open discussion, the, 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 um, where the community gets to, to provide some feedback. And um, Stephen, I'm not remembering where we came down on that. Maybe you don't either. Um, but uh, I, I, so I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think one one of the things that we were um, that we wanted to kind of expand on the uh, the number of um, participants in in Mecca was to be able to kind of um, expand our knowledge of what else was going on in the in the industry, um, and and this was one of the things that that came up um, at the time, and we. Um, we, we kind of felt that we, you know we were so far down um, down the line with what we were doing that we would continue with that. Um, as we say, we we have been um, uh, we are now a recommended practice uh, for NISO, which means that things are going to change a little bit for us. Um, we're we're now going to change to to be more of a steering committee and uh, and things like that to rather than you know actually forming the the recommendations. And what we're going to be doing with that is we're going to be looking a bit more at these various different industry activities uh, and seeing um, what might be appropriate, such as pub fair, um, for us to either collaborate with. Um, or you know, join with in some way. See, see um, which areas there are of, uh, uh, of of common interest. Thank you for that. We have to move on now. But if you wouldn't mind, in the meeting notes, adding maybe some more details on what your aims and focus is, that might help the person who asked the question. Thanks very much, Amanda. And uh, next up, we've got Carolina Sanchez. Um, also a presenter uh, intended for Spain. Um, so yeah. Carolina, thanks for joining us today. Are you there? Hello, do you hear Hi. me? We can hear you. Have you got slides as well? Yeah, okay. Here. Do you see my screen? All set. Perfect. So, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting us to be part of Force 11 and uh, thank you. So my name is Carolina and in the next five minutes, I'm going to rapidly present to you the indisputable benefits of having an open source, no code repository solutions at an institutional level. So I'm going to use the, the example of Polaris Orbit. So let's start by addressing a major, if not uh, the biggest challenge faced by institutions. Almost without exception, research institutions face budgetary pressure and a lack of IT resources to handle all the challenges that exist with the rise of the big data era. Um, having an international repository is no exception. So open repositories, by definition, need some serious programming skills from the initial point of setup to customizing and updating it over the course of its use, which means institutions need an IT team to handle this, or repository managers and librarians need to have this skill set, and more often than not, it's a mix of, of both. So uh, add to this the issues of long and complex deposit workflows with lengthy metadata filling and metadata curation processes, or integrations between system and databases leading to the time invested there to ensure completeness and metadata quality. Measurements and appraisals remain relatively manual for the most part, and time wasted at surveying um, and ma ma managing data. So technically and financially speaking, we are looking at what starts off as a, as a small scale operation spiraling out to be an unmanageable task for repository managers and librarians. Apart from its more prominence and source after measures, the solution has a technical edge. Being low code means regaining control and independent management of the system. It's a must have for this kind of technology and let me explain why. First of all, a no-code solution allows repository managers and librarians with no programming skills to set up a high-quality open repository and to customize complex functions. Second, a no-code solution provides tools which help repository managers and librarians to exert, to exert full control over all the functions that you can see here in the poster. I don't know if you see it or it's a little bit small. So it's like um, customized workflow, tailored tools, so it, it, and so on. And all of this with uh, no extra coding in a simple and intuitive way. 
third and awkward solution looks like here, like, like the picture you can see here in the poster, and almost everything can be modified. And finally, an no-code solution will empower data repository managers, curators, and developers by giving them the possibility to easily build and maintain a powerful, evolving open source repository. So to sum up, Polaris OS by my science work is a major technological breakthrough to improve data management, analyze resource impact, and better user experience. Suffice to say that the need of an easy to set up, relatively simple to maintain, effortless to update and convenient to use repository is at the heart of the solution. So if you have any questions. Nicely done, you've earned us a minute. Thank you, Carolina. Does anyone have questions? Amanda. Uh, I am not seeing any questions. Does anyone have questions for Carolina? Please add them. Not any questions right now. So I'll ask a question, I suppose, since we have time. Carolina, can you, um, uh, what is your favorite thing about um, the system? About Polaris OS, like um, that it's so flexible. So you can use it with no programming skills and you can set up and customize vocabulary control list, uh, workflows. So it's very useful for data repositories or even researchers who doesn't have a lot of IT programming skills and they, are, they will be able to, to set up many things um, and gain um, independent uh, management of the, of the solution. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, again, as Amanda said, uh, further questions and discussion are very welcome um, in the Google Doc and in the chat. So to please do carry on. Um, we will move on now to Alex Freeman. Hi. Hi, Alex. I should just try and share my screen. Hopefully you can see that. Great. Can you see my screen? Yeah, you're all set. Perfect. So I'm going to talk briefly about Octopus, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know it, it's a new platform designed to be the primary research record. So splitting what scientific journals do away from the core bits of trying to get across science in a way that's reproducible and has the methods in full. And its aim is to try and change the incentive system in science, because at the moment everybody's working towards writing papers and the narrative uh, and publishing necessities of papers sort of m drive you towards questionable research practices, because you're trying to write a neat, beautiful narrative, you're trying to get influential results. And that means that we're seeing a lot of publication biases as a result of people not publishing small data sets, not publishing um, their full methodology, all these kinds of things. So Octopus is something that's been in development for uh, about almost two years. And we've now got a demo version, which I just wanted to show people. Um, it's designed to be instant publication. So there is no peer review before publication. All peer review is after publication. Um, and everything that you publish in Octopus is actually, it's not a full paper. You publish in smaller units. So building on what Chris was talking about earlier about smaller units of publication. So for instance, I'm going to just show you around the demo a little bit now. So if we wanted to uh, have a look at a publication, I will show you the publication chains. So, for instance, um, here is a publication in Octopus, which is a protocol. And you can see here at the top of the screen, it shows the chain of the different kinds of publication that you can publish. Now, everything in Octopus has to be linked to an existing publication. So you can't publish a protocol or a method without it being linked to I have a hypothesis or at least a theoretical rationale. And that in itself has to be linked to a problem. And as you can see, you can then have these branching chains of publication, which brings everything about a particular subject or tackling a particular problem into one branching tree, makes it much easier to find things. 
And the fact that we now have uh, smaller publications means that it's faster to publish, it's easier to publish, and uh, you have smaller um, publication, um, smaller author groups. So that allows greater degrees of specialization. Uh, it's more meritocratic. It's more accountable. And it also, this system allows that freedom to publish small data sets, uh, negative results, as we call them. So trying to break that, um, that link between publication and questionable research practices. So I'll show you here the things that you can do with a publication. Um, once you're reading it, you can rate it. So you can rate it on predefined criteria, which are different for each type of publication. You can write a linked publication. So this would be the sort of thing that you want to do if you want to do an analysis of this data, for instance. You can write a review or you can red flag it if you think there's a problem with this um, publication and you can then go into a, a conversation with the authors about that publication. There's the additional information and metadata and uh, the publications carry all sorts of information just the same as any other kind of publication which you can then download in a pdf and all of the things that you do on the site are linked to your personal profile so this is how it changes the incentive structure because you are everything you publish is recorded um, and it adds to your cv and that includes reviews as well as all the other types of publication so there are eight types of publication in octopus and a peer review is an equal on an equal footing to all others so that means that um, good peer reviewing and good critiquing is now part of the incentive structure to get good publications and if any of these had been rated by peers then their ratings would appear here so at a glance you can now tell what type of uh, researcher I am what type of publications I'm publishing I'm actually extremely well rounded as you can see from my user profile here I've published all kinds of publications but this would be an excellent at a glance summary for somebody who is looking to hire a researcher or for funders looking for uh, well rated protocols potentially to fund or um, looking at individuals and their profiles so octopus as I say is now available as a demo the URL is on the Google Doc and at the footer of every page there's a little feedback link so please do leave feedback. I would love to get people's um, thoughts about how this works, of course now that link's not going to work. Um, I'd love to get people's thoughts about how it would work um, and any bugs and uh, we're hoping now we're working on pre-populating the whole of Octopus with things from the open access um, uh, core at JISC so that come September we hope to be able to launch it full of thousands of existing publications for you to then start reviewing and linking your own publications to. But as I say, very keen to get um, feedback on this. So all questions and all feedback, very welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. I think we've got a time for one question, Amanda. Okay, we do have a number of questions. I'll put them in the meeting notes so you can follow up later. One question uh, is, hey there, so what is your strategy if researchers have a number of hypotheses or hypotheses in, um, in the module, but when you read them, they really sound like the same thing. How do you consolidate those? That's a, a good question. Um, and in fact, what we do is we have um, uh, on the rating system, and I'm just sharing my screen so you can see here, here is, uh, well, it's uh, not a hypothesis actually, but um, many of the publication types have originality as one of the key things that they're rated on. So if this was actually a hypothesis that had been published before, and I'm just slightly rephrasing it, then I would get very low rating on uh, originality. So hopefully that would um, mean that then the en search engines within Octopus would rate that very low. And I wouldn't want a low rated hypothesis on my uh, CV as it were. So it would disincentivize me from writing unoriginal material. Thank you for that. I'll add the other ones to the uh, document. So you can the document them now. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Amanda. So we'll move on now to Christina Drummond. 
Hi there. Thank you for having me. Um, go ahead and switch my screen here. So everyone, I have the pleasure of talking to you today uh, representing the Open Access eBook Usage Data Trust effort. Um, I'm based at the Educopia Institute as the program officer for this effort, but I'm here representing a very large team which you'll get to hear more about shortly. So let me see, hopefully everyone can see that. And we can kind of go forward from here. So my goal today is to give you a little bit of background about what this project is and how you can engage because um, unlike a lot of the efforts we've heard today, we're actually in the post planning um, kind of pilot development stage for what is essentially a data exchange platform around usage data specific to open access monographs. Uh, so really think about the humanities and the social sciences here at the forefront, um, but not only the data exchange platform, but also a data trust mechanism to govern and manage that platform as a community. Um, so to kind of to go through that a little bit and unpack it a bit. This is all born out of this need for thinking through um, how do we report and think through the intersection between discovery usage and impact. A lot of institutions came together, well actually this all started in 2015 in a conversation at SEI, where a number of institutions commented how they had similar challenges in pulling together the different reports they needed given the variety of platforms and dissemination mechanisms for OA monographs. Um, and when thinking about how now, especially with funders, they're looking for that information about the performance and readership and reach of open access collections. Um, they wanted to find a way to start pulling that data across the ecosystem, not just within their own singular institution um, or a singular repository. Um, at the same time, there are efforts and interests in thinking about open access investment impacts and how to benchmark uh, collections, for example, an open access collection against one that isn't open access. So, there are a lot of challenges that have come to the fore and our effort right now is actually building on this 2015 and forward uh, effort. We're funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and kind of a phase two of this project. And then the first page, it's, we brought together over 70 organizations, both in person and online, to think through what are the challenges that exist today to getting this information. Um, diverse data sources, the diversity of platforms, and really the diversity among the types of publishers that are generating usage data and disseminating platforms for this data um, really make it harder for the open access monographs compared to journal articles. Um, in addition, if you think of it this way, this is not a problem one institution could solve on its own. To start thinking towards benchmarking and aggregating that information so you can look at how your collection is doing within the broader ecosystem, you have to have access to that aggregated sensitive information. Um, and so all of that begat this data trust concept. How do we encourage individual organizations to come together? Because really for this usage data to be useful, as you see here in this quote, um, to have that potential of unlocking impact by looking at usage data, you need to have comparable data that's trusted and granular and has the ability of being benchmarked. The data trust, as I mentioned, is really a way to get at that data by bringing together um, a community, if you will, of trusted individuals where it, it provides a data commons that is governed not only by competitors, but really through that cooperation. So people can put in their information and have access to this broader data lake, if you will. Um, but it really depends on trust among those partners and a belief, if you will, in how that system is being operated. Um, and really the pilot right now is thinking through how do we build this infrastructure on one hand, but also how do we build the governance mechanisms on the other to make that possible. And as you see here, the things that we're trying to make possible are really the economies of scale so that small independent publishers who may not have the technical capacity, university presses, um, to pull together information and normalize it, have the ability to still look at these impact reports. Um, I've already talked about kind of lowering that cost to a number of the different stakeholders we're working with, but, and also having the ability to put the usage data in this broader context across platforms and across systems and formats, um, but also having that ability to give this usage data insight 
mechanism to a wide variety of stakeholders. So not just commercial publishers, independent presses, but also our university presses and library publishers, as well as potentially down the road, authors and scholars themselves who want to see how things are playing out, um, if certain outreach campaigns are working, if their information is getting cited and used in broader ways. So at the end of the day, all of this usage, um, these usage metrics really are getting towards where is this information being used? How is, you know, how is the publication in the OA book itself being used in the broader? So I did mention this is building on a two-year planning project that was also funded by Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, and that's where we got a number of, of these kind of quotes and this feedback about what we needed to build, as well as putting forth the action plan that we're implementing now. Those recommendations are documented in a white paper that was published by BISG, and you see the link here. Um, but really, it set forth our goals for this particular project, not only building a diverse community of stakeholders to create this infrastructure and inform its development, really basing it in user-centered design, um, but to build that infrastructure as use cases and understand the ebook supply chain, if you will, um, alongside this process of building out that organizational governance and sustainability models to maintain a data trust moving forward. There's a lot of diversity that we're trying to manage here. Um, organizational diversity and the types of stakeholders we're engaging in scholarly communications landscape. Um, not only with respect to the scale of their OA publishing activity, but also their geographic location. This is a global effort. Um, and the types of monographs they're publishing, the languages, the type of technical platforms they're using. That said, I did mention that we have a very diverse team. I'm gonna keep these in the slides for folks to reference later, um, but we're working with a number of very well-recognized platforms, services, and presses, um, both within the academy and on the commercial side. That brings me to my ask for this group, which is to know that we wanted to extend and really connect with the community as we build this um, to make sure that we're meeting everyone's needs and we have a firm kind of understanding of what's needed out there. So with that, we've actually launched six open discussion groups um, for peer organizations to unpack what are those use cases to reflect on what data visualizations may be and to inform the development, not only of the technology, but the data trust organization itself. Um, and we have two working groups as well. So that brings me to my call for all of you to, if you're interested in this, if OA eBooks and those analytic metrics is something you're working with, to come and join us. And you can either join us directly here um, on this webpage and join the Google group you're interested in, or in the agenda, there's also a link to an opt-in form that will get you there as well. So with that, I can pause for questions. Thanks, thanks, Christine. I'm afraid we don't have any time um, for questions, as we do want to hear from our, our last speaker um, in the last five minutes. But if you could stick around and keep an eye on the, the Google Doc um, for, for that discussion, we'd appreciate it. So we do want to move over um, to um, Heather Staines. Um, Heather is back online. Fabulous. Um, Heather, you've got uh, five minutes plus two minutes for questions, and we'd encourage you guys to stick around for our concluding remarks as well. Um, but if you do have to peel away, uh, the, the conversation will be recorded. So Heather, over to you. Great. I hope you can see my screen. You're good. Okay. I'm going to zoom through this relatively quickly. Um, I'm really excited um, to be here today uh, to tell you a little bit about the PubPub dashboard, which was released um, maybe six or seven weeks ago now. And for those who joined Open Publishing Fest, I did a presentation on how we at KFG use uh, PubPub as a Google Docs alternative. So I included in the notes a link to that uh, presentation. I can, uh, I can put the video link in there as well. So this is our, um, our Knowledge Futures community where we do all of our internal uh, agendas, document drafts, contract drafts, things like that. And I wanna draw your attention to the upper right here where it says dashboard. So if I click on the dashboard link, um, I can go to the community dashboard. So one thing that's important to note is that there are um, dashboards for each level. Um, so this is the highest level where you can get insight into your entire community, see how many collections, how many pubs, how many discussions are taking places and whether there are any reviews. Um, through the dashboard, you can see a list of all the pages that you've created as part of your community and you can get to each one of those and edit them. You can see reviews, which is something I can't talk about today, but we're excited about, which is enabling folks to use PubPub for a um, manuscript submission um, workflow. 
you can see who has member access to the community. So again, this is at the community level. Um, this is for our team. So we all have admin level, but with you have very granular ability um, to give rights to folks and they can do a variety of different things across your community. And then you also have access um, to the settings. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting, if we go to Frankenbook, which is an example some of you have heard me talk about before and go into the dashboard for Frankenbook, is you can see a little bit more readily how the collections work. So across the Frankenbook site, if I scroll down, you can see volume one, volume two, volume three, how they've got nine, 10, and eight uh, pubs in them but you can also see that there is a collection called Frankenstein book. So through the dashboard view, you can really get um, an immediate impression of how uh, pubs can be in more than one collection and how that organizational structure can work. Um, I wanna show you really quickly, this is the Harvard Data Science Review um, site. And if I go to their dashboard, um, I wanna take you into um, uh, one of the issue levels. So if we go to their issue 1.1, which was the, the first one that they did um, last year, um, we can see the collection view. Um, and uh, I can see all of the information that's here in the collection. Now, I don't have admin access to this collection. So um, some of the things like members and settings that were accessible on the other one are not um, accessible here. Um, and I really, the last thing I wanna show you is um, how uh, version history comes into play. So if we go into the pub um, dashboard, so I can still have access to my community dashboard, but I can see my pub dashboard as well. Uh, I have access here um, on the pub dashboard. Sorry, it's a little bit slow. My kids are playing uh, computer games upstairs. You have access to the entire um, release history here in your pub dashboard. So I'm happy to, um, to take questions. Uh, to tell you more about it. Again, I've included a link that will go over this in a lot of detail, but we're really excited to get feedback from you on um, how you might see using dashboards in your community. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Amanda, have any questions come through for Heather? Not yet. Does anyone have questions for Heather? Not any at the very moment. Shall we move on to questions for the entire crowd? Um, we could take a couple. Are there any? Type away if anyone has questions for right. any of our presenters today. All right, in the meantime, I'm just going to go ahead and, and share a few um, public service announcements. Um, Anita uh, DeWard, again, on behalf of the FORCE 2020 Program Committee, is just going to add a few notes about the, um, the call for proposals to follow in the new year. So I'm just going to add that to the Google Doc. Keep an eye out for that. Um, the Summer Institute for Force 11 is taking place online this year from August 3rd to 13th. There are a variety of, um, of affordable registration fees available as well as scholarships, so please do take a look. Um, we're excited that, uh, that so many more people should be able to attend this institute since it's virtual this year. And it's, it's um, been widely praised, so I hope, hope you agree. Um, Force 11 working groups, um, we're keen to, to have those um, kind of get some of the energy and momentum um, that Forces has been known for in earlier years. So if you guys have an idea for coming together uh, and working across the globe, across the internet on something, um, please do uh, think about starting a working group. The infrastructure interview series uh, that Jennifer Kemp has been uh, organizing uh, is just running at full speed every month. She's got a new conversation online. So uh, do a plug into those. Um, many, many, many thanks to Amanda and Candace on the call here who have uh, helped to share information about Force 11 and these new initiatives rated consistently through um, email networks and, and social. You wouldn't know about it if it wasn't for their work. Um, I've said a couple times that the Force 11 meeting that was um, pre previously scheduled for um, San Donostia in Spain, uh, was for previously scheduled for October 2020, is now going to be in 2021. So um, stand by for details about that. And otherwise, you can always find us on, on Twitter and Slack and on the website. So um, that's me done. Amanda, did you come up with, uh, with further questions for our presenters? There is one question. I will add my personal thanks to everyone on the call for participation. 
Besides sharing here amongst developers and activists, lack of a better term, how can the Open Skull Com commun community make sure that open platforms get a stage where they're accepted into the broader 